Right, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to call Chairman Bharat Pay and former Chairman SBI, Mr. Rajneesh Kumar, on to the stage. A very warm welcome, sir. Let me also call upon TV9 Anshuman Tiwari to host this session. Over to you, sir. Again, uh, uh, I was reading, uh, recently reading this famous book of uh, Richard S. Taylor, and he said a very interesting thing, which is, I think, probably connects with the India's fintech story, is this first, never underestimate the power of inertia, and second, the power can be harnessed. So you have been witnessed the inertia and revolution of Indian banking sector. You've been all the way through that, seeing the transformation of Indian banking industry uh, from a, from a manually labor-oriented industry to the digitally powered one. one. <coughs> and uh, uh, before we begin this discussion on the, uh, on the FinTech, uh, would you like to share some personal experience that how you have been all through the two different generations of, of Indian BFSI industry? Yeah, so I joined the State Bank of India in 1980. Yeah. And the environment at that time was that every bookkeeping and every function was manual. And today, when you look back in 2024, it's a completely changed world. There was a time when balancing the books, that itself used to be a huge task. The customer's money, when you are collecting or remitting, it was a pain. You would never get interest on your deposits in time. So that was the scenario. And then gradually thereafter, uh, I would consider 1984 as a watershed moment in the history of banking when a bipartite settlement was signed with the unions which allowed computerization of the banks. At that time, there were not many uh, private sector banks in the form what we see today. And uh, to give you an example that in 1984, I was working in HR department of the State Bank of India and we acquired an electronic typewriter, yes. which cost 75,000 rupees in 84. And then came PCXT, AT, and then the world has completely changed. And in this uh, century, it is the advent of internet banking and mobile banking. Like any other service people consume, so banking is now mostly consumed through uh, mobile banking and internet banking. So it has been a long journey. It has been helped by the fact that in 1991, uh, the Indian economy and the banking system was unshackled. There was a rise of what we call new generation private sector banks, likes of ICICI Bank, HDFC Bank, uh, UTI Bank, and now which is called Axis Bank. And that brought in competition, that brought in a new approach, that brought in adoption of technology in a big way. And it goes to the credit of the state-owned banks that they also adopted technology and have been able to compete in the market. The another, I would consider to be a very, very important event in the history of banking and financial inclusion is August 2014 when our Honorable Prime Minister and he announced Jandhan Yojana. So the ingredients were there for that program to succeed. It's not that there were no financial inclusion initiatives in the past, but August 14 brought a paradigm shift and when 35 crore accounts were opened, and that is supported by, again, technology. It is impossible to open and manage such a huge number of accounts, and that too in the remotest area of the country, unless it is supported by the technology. And of course, there was another important ingredient was the business correspondent model. So with this two and Jam Trinity, and that is what has done wonders for the banking system in India. 
uh, payment system again, like uh, I'm sure you will be asking the <coughs> question. So I will cover there, but this is the opening remark that how in this 40, uh, 40 years, uh, the face of Indian banking has completely changed and it is amongst one of the best in the world today. <coughs> Sir, uh, definitely uh, Indian banking and finance industry has seen a metamorphosis in just one decade, uh, the way you have seen it going. Uh, but cash still remains the king. And uh, with your experience in the traditional banking and now the new fintech banking, which is called neo banking, how long do you think that cash will remain in the dominance, considering the rise of uh, digital transactions? One is that, uh, as far as cash is concerned, it is the easiest way of doing transactions. It cannot be denied. And uh, there is an explosion as far as the digital transactions are concerned, and uh, particularly for a small value. And uh, cash in circulation in the economy after demonetization, as percentage of GDP it has come down by about half percentage point. But it's still the convenience of cash. Uh, we would try to replace, but it is not happening. Uh, <clears throat> but sir, here comes a puzzle uh, that despite uh, the uh, concurrent rise in digital transactions and uh, explosion of currency in circulation, this inclusion of money into the system has not seamlessly translated into the consumerate demand of uh, uh, demand in the GDP. And can you unravel this, this whole mystery about us? Because we have got enough money available in the market system, both in the digital and the cash, but the GDP growth is not reflecting that supply of money. No, I think we are growing decently as far as GDP is concerned, and particularly in nominal terms. The GDP growth is around 13 to 14 percent. And uh, uh, for GDP, there are so many things. Uh, it can be consumption-led. It can be infrastructure-led. So in our country, what is happening that uh, I agree that consumption has not grown as much. But on the other side, the investment in infrastructure, uh, which has increased at least almost, I think, fourfold. Now the uh, central government budget alone is about 11 trillion rupees or 11 lakh crore rupees. And infrastructure, we know, it has huge multiplier effect. So to say that GDP has not grown, uh, I won't agree with that statement. I think we are doing quite a decent job considering the overall global geopolitical scenario. And uh, India is today considered to be the only shining example as far as GDP growth is concerned. The uh, disposable income, you may say, or the consumption, uh, I think even today there is uh, some analysis which has appeared in the newspapers that the gap between the rural and urban consumption, yes. it is coming down. So it's, it's happening, but uh, of course, the elements which are driving the growth and the productivity of our economy they are a bit different. Sir, now I come to the difficult part of the fintech industry. Suddenly, from a success story, fintech has emerged, emerging as one of the primary risks for the core banking industry. Uh, there are a lot of vulnerabilities has been come off late. Uh, RBI has started uh, tightening the screw of regulations. Uh, as part of your uh, old regime, you are part of the old core banking, and now you are leading a fintech uh, uh, revolution. What are the core, core vulnerabilities you think of the digital transaction and entire fintech space has that? And have regulators failed to anticipate these inherent risk of connected banking, which is now started creating a lot of problems across the banking universe? No, as far as connected banking is concerned, I mean, that is something you can't wish on. It will remain. We live in a connected world, whether it is banking or whatever uh, services you consume today. You do it through a connected world, whether it is your personal transport need, whether it is your health. So you take any example and you can't live without a mobile today. That is the reality. And uh, about the risks, whenever something new happens, new technology happens, even the previous sessions there was a discussion. So whenever something new happens, it brings in certain positives and it brings risks. So today in the connected world, the huge risk around cybersecurity, the huge risk around data protection, 
frauds, cyber frauds, all those risks are there. But one thing uh, uh, which has come out very clearly is that if anyone is part of a highly regulated ecosystem, then even if a fintech is not directly regulated, but they work closely with the regulated entities. And regulated entities we know from experience, I have chaired the State Bank for three years, I was its managing director, risk and compliance. Mm -hmm. Regulation is a different one. To the credit of the young entrepreneurs, they have brought in a lot of innovation for the benefit of what we call financially excluded. So fintechs have played, and I'm talking more on the payment and lending side and investment side, they have done a wonderful job. But there is a certain responsibility cast on the regulators. You would have heard of FATF. Yes. Nobody would like India to win that gray list, you know? And then you have to regulate the system. I think three primary things, apart from many, many functions which a central bank or regulator does is, uh, one is that there should not be a systematic risk developing. Second is consumer disclosures and protection. That is a must. And the rules around what we call KYC and anti-money laundry. So if anyone for that matter fiddles around that. But uh, how do you view this crackdown on PTM? Uh, some argue in the fintech industry that regulators are getting over stringent on that and this is, uh, this is in a way stifling the growth of a startup and a sort of fledgling industry which is coming up. Uh, I really don't know what is the inside story. Whatever you know, I know that is all what we have read in the newspapers or seen on the television. But the fact of the matter is, as I said, that having an experience of dealing with the regulators uh, in a very big way. I think there is always a chance given for course correction. Nobody is perfect. If you look at the entire banking or financial system, there will be somewhere some weaknesses. There are periodically audits, reports, inspections by Reserve Bank of India. There is a, always a chance given to do the course correction. That is my, I am talking about from my personal experience and then your intent to do the course correction. Many a times, uh, you know, a state bank is such a huge bank. So uh, every task uh, is uh, huge. So sometimes there would be timelines. You may not be able to meet those timelines. But then, honestly, if you go to the regulator and tell their difficulties, I don't think uh, uh, they are unreasonable people. So, uh, I mean, that is my take on this. And uh, what happened in Paytm's case, I have not seen the report, you have not seen the report. So whatever Reserve Bank tells us, or whatever uh, media tries to dig out, so we just go on that <coughs> presumption. But it seems to be a case where, prima facie on my experience, I can say that regulators must have felt that they are not being taken seriously. That's the only conclusion I can draw. Uh, let's move to the other challenge of the fintech industry. Uh, I was going through the recent uh, IMF report and it says that the fintech uh, adoption in the, across the world, especially in the third world, is in the low income income groups. And they, uh, they are digitally exposed uh, with the, all their privacies to the, to the cyber hackers. And the report says that 30% of their savings actually been taken away by, by cyber, cyber hackers every year. Uh, how do you think that how the fin uh, current fintech industry is prepared to, to protect their vulnerabilities and their, their exposure to that here? Yeah, as I said that banking is always a risky business and more so the payments. And uh, uh, in my opening remark also I said that uh, cyber security and uh, data privacy and data security, these are the two biggest challenges. Uh, time to time, the banking system, the payment system, we keep on strengthening. And we have to also realize that the people who you call cyber thieves or the dark side of net, they are equally smart people. They are, so <laughs> it is a typical like uh, uh, police and chore game or whatever you call it. So that is going on. 
and uh, like uh, you take one step and then you find uh, there is uh, they they are uh, sometimes ahead of you so this battle and this struggle i think that will continue to go on but again uh, uh, the uh, the laws the regulation and the compliance and ability to foresee the risks and not take things lightly the compliance culture uh, that needs uh, i mean some sort of a zero tolerance when it comes to compliance and your security of your systems <coughs> so we have we have finally come to the end of the session just one last five five second anything big you are going to tell about the bharat pay is going to do in coming weeks coming months no bharat pay is a first it is a b2b in the sense that uh, we are into merchant acquisition and uh, we have taken a more balanced approach when we do the customer acquisition there was a time when it was all numbers around growth tpv gmv and what not but from uh, like uh, for last 2 uh, 3 years when i took charge we have done some course correction we are doing business in a very solid manner and in a very compliant manner we are not a directly regulated entity but we work we realize that we are working in that system which is highly regulated it is a principal and agent relationship so what are the obligations cast on the principal which is a nbfc or a bank so we take it very seriously and in a very systematic manner we are developing our business it will it is a we are building a sustainable business it is not that uh, we want to uh, just for the sake of valuation purpose do something silly thank you <clears throat> thank you mr kumar for joining us for this special session thank you sir thank you thank you thank you very much anshuman rajneesh sir for taking time out and for joining us thank you so for much. those words of wisdom thank you so much thank you so much